The yeah, presentation yeah. is yeah. entitled Earth Fault Current Analysis for Power Cable Transmission Lines. <clears throat> Just an overview or outline of the presentation. Uh, firstly, I'll cover the key points. I'll talk about the benefits and why you should perform earth fault current analysis. I'll talk about um, cable transmission line construction, transmission line earthing systems, earth fault currents and earth potential rise. And I'll present two case studies uh, of okay. complex cable and overhead transmission line uh, fault current studies. I'll draw some in important conclusions and recommendations at the end. Uh, and I'll do a little bit of hands-on uh, with SafeGrid earthing software. Uh, just very, very briefly, what is SafeGrid earthing software? Because the modeling, the calculations have been done using this software. SafeGrid is finite element-based grounding analysis software. Uh, it can model uh, complex custom earthing systems of any size, any arrangement in multi-layered soils. It can model below ground uh, or above ground earthing systems. It can perform uh, earthing calculations at low or high frequencies in the frequency domain or the time domain. Uh, and it's, it's also fully optimized. Um, just so you know, we will, we will be recording this presentation. Um, feel free to uh, visit the link there to download a free trial now. Uh, you can uh, actually try and use the fault current distribution calculator within the software. Let's talk about the presentation, the objectives. To demonstrate earth fault current analysis for complex cable transmission lines consisting of underground cables with varying sheet bonding arrangements, as well as overhead lines. The methodology of the calculations will a circuit model approach is used, whereby the transmission lines are represented by their dimensional and electrical parameters, and the mutual inductive and capacitive impedances are being considered to solve for fault currents and voltages. Essentially, it's a, a like a nodal analysis, electrical circuit analysis, uh, that's used by the software, and it considers um, uh, mutual impedances uh, between the parallel uh, conductive components. Like I said, the software used is uh, the fault current uh, distribution calculator or module in elect safe grid earthing software. That's included with the software. Let's talk about the three main benefits of performing earth fault current analysis. Uh, the first one, just move that out of the way. The first one is accurate, realistic earth potential rise. Earth potential rise, touch, and step voltages associated with the earthing system are directly proportional to the magnitude of the fault current uh, directly discharging into the soil. Therefore, it is important to, to determine how much of the fault current actually returns to the source via. Uh, the cable screens or overhead earth wires, as opposed to how much of the current is directed into the earthing system, giving rise to uh, EPR and touch and step voltages. Uh, it's important to understand fault current distribution uh, for, for that reason. What portion of the fault current is discharged into the substation earthing system? And very often that will be much lower, substantially lower than the maximum or prospective uh, fault current available. And this is of significant benefit um, to the, the significant benefit to uh, determining the actual fault current distribution. Uh, with that, the earthing point number three, the earthing design is simplified. If we only, when, when designing the earthing system, if we only need to, to deal with a portion, often, very often a small portion of the prospective earth fault current, this can dramatically reduce um, touch and step voltages and greatly, therefore greatly simplify the design. 
uh, making it simpler and more economical. Let's look at um, typical cable transmission lines. These are often used um, where it's impractical or unsafe to use overhead lines because, of course, overhead lines are, are very much cheaper. Um, so uh, in urban areas or where we're passing through environmentally sensitive uh, areas, we would often use cables. Um, and there are common types of these cable transmission lines. That's where um, a, an underground, underground cable link between two substations is the first common type. The second common type is a substation fed by an overhead line, as well as in series with an underground cable link. And then you'll see in the diagram there, which is a siphon system. That's where you have two, two sections of overhead line either side of a cable link in the middle. Transmission line earthing systems. Um, there's lots of uh, different interconnected earthing systems to do with uh, a transmission line. Uh, obviously, at, at both ends of the substation, uh, those, uh, those substations have their own earthing systems, and those are interconnected with, with the other systems along the line which would be, uh, for example, um, the overhead tower footings. Uh, overhead towers often have their own earthing systems. Uh, also for the cables, uh, cable bonding points, um, they too would have their own earthing systems. And uh, transition uh, locations, transition poles, or transition uh, ancillary facilities, uh, they too would have their own earthing systems. So all of these uh, earthing systems need to be considered because they are all interconnected and there are complex pathways uh, during earth fault conditions. There are com complex pathways to these currents. So what happens during an earth fault? Um, well, at a high level, when an earth fault occurs in a transmission system, the fault current will return to the source via the metallic return paths, uh, as well as through the soil itself. So metallic re return paths include earth wires of overhead lines, uh, sheet, screen, or armor, uh, depending, they must be uh, obviously solidly bonded at both ends, and then fault currents will, will travel along those paths. Uh, uh, and then um, earth, uh, continuity conductors, ECC conductors as well. Uh, those will uh, also carry fault currents for cable transmission lines. And what happens at the earthing systems? Um, you'll see as current is injected um, into the soil at these locations, uh, this causes a voltage rise with respect to uh, reference earth. Um, uh, it's caused by, by the current in, in series with the impedance and you get the voltage. Um, if you plot um, or you simulate and then plot uh, EPR, uh, ground surface voltage, you can see a ground surface voltage plot uh, there at the bottom, uh, earth potential rise or ground surface voltages um, decrease significantly with distance away from the electrode or the earthing system. Fault currents in cable transmission lines. Uh, so the fault, so the, the faulted phase um, obviously carries current. Uh, so if we're talking about a single phase fault, it will be a, a single core uh, or a single phase of the, the cable circuit uh, will carry the current. This will cause an imbalance or an unbalance of current. Uh, also in a multi-core cable, the, the story is the same. Um, and when, uh, so this there is a coupling that's made between the faulted current carrying um, phase conductor and the metallic components of the cable, be that the screen uh, or the sheath or the armor, and a voltage is induced and a, therefore a current will flow. Uh, this, this obviously depends on um, 
the, the, the sheath being bonded at both ends. Um, and a portion of the total earth hole current will uh, travel uh, along these metallic return paths and a portion of the fault current, we're talking about when a fault occurs at, at one end, for example, at, at one of the substations, and a portion will, will return by the, the cable screens or sheath, and a portion will enter the earthing system, in, into the ground and cause a voltage rise and return to the source via the, the ground itself. Let's look at an exa a simple example of a solidly bonded uh, cable system. Uh, th this is in the software. So let me explain the schematic here. Uh, you have numbered nodes. Uh, these are mm, connection points. And so you have three phase conductors, phase A, B, and C at the top. Phase A is connected between uh, nodes one and six. And we are simulating so we have the we've incorporated the earthing system into this uh, and the return paths into this model. So we have all the three phase conductors, and we can simulate different types of fault. And we have uh, three cable screens because there are three phases, and there is those screens are surrounding each of the phase conductors in the cable. And the, all of the screens are connected to the same two nodes, four and, and nine. They, this is a solidly bonded cable system. So the screens are bo bonded at both ends, nodes four and nine. <clears throat> and node four, you could um, picture as the, the top of the, the earthing system uh, to the, the, we call that the local site or the local, let's say it's the local substation earthing system on the left-hand side. Now that earthing system has a particular impedance. It's not particularly important, but it, it does affect the, the distribution, the fault current distribution. Now on the right-hand side, you've got EG remote. Of course, um, there's an upstream uh, substation and the current is being fed from the upstream substation. And <clears throat> you can see there's a short circuit being simulated. That's effectively a, a short uh, conductor connected between nodes one and four. That's simulating a single phase to, to earth fault um, at the local substation uh, and uh, phase conductor A is being faulted. <clears throat> the currents are shown and the directions of the currents are shown on the schematic. So you've got 1000 amps now that's your prospective earth fault current level. Now that enters node four, which is the, say the top of the earthing system uh, of the local site. Now the, the current has a, a pathway here and um, you can see that the vast majority of the 1000 amps returns via the cable screens. Now those, those, it's not equally shared. Screen A is carrying much more current than screen B and screen C. That's because screen A surrounds phase conductor A. Therefore, it's more uh, highly coupled with the uh, the fault current source, which is phase conductor A. In total, in this example, this is a typical uh, cable connection of a substation. Uh, and these are the typical values we see, 96% of the total prospective fault current uh, returns to the source via the cable screens and does not enter the local earthing system. Um, so that's a very high proportion um, of the, the fault currents. Hence the, the real advantage of doing these studies as they can significantly simplify um, your earthing system design requirements. Let's talk about fault currents, the same type of fault currents in overhead lines. It's a little bit different and it's a, you could say it's a little bit more complicated. Now, if you look at this schematic, you've got, obviously you've got multiple um, transmission towers and those are connected there's a transmission line, 
connected between substation A and substation B. Substation A and, and substation B both have their own earthing systems. And each of the towers has its uh, their own earthing systems as well. And they, they're obviously carrying uh, face conductors. And there is an earth wire, or there could be multiple earth wires, that is bonded at each of the towers and it's bonded at each end of the, the line, which is the substation. Basically, the earth wires are bonded at each of the substation earthing systems. Now, when we have a single phase or an earth fault um, on, the, on the line, let's, let's talk about at the substations. <clears throat> You, you end up with this complex distribution of fault currents. Now, if the, if the earth fault, the single phase to earth fault is at substation A on the left-hand side, a portion of the fault current will enter, enter substation A earthing system and it will enter the soil and will return to the source. Suppose that's at substation B uh, uh, via the soil. Um, also, a portion of the total earth fault current will return to the source by the earth wire itself. Now, this depends highly on the coupling, the mutual coupling between the phase conductor, the, the faulted phase conductor, and, <clears throat> and the earth wire itself, which is dependent on mainly on the separation. So compared to cable systems, the separation between an overhead earth wire and a faulted phase conductor on a transmission tower is significantly greater compared to a cable. We'll, we'll, but we'll come to that. <clears throat> the other thing that's being shown here are the stray currents. So as the fault current returns to the, the source by the overhead earth wire, some stray currents enter the soil via the overhead um, transmission tower earthing systems. And they enter the soil. They also enter the other the earthing systems of other transmission towers. And so this, this really requires modeling, uh, which the, the software does automatically. And that's also why it's important when you have when you're modeling a transmission line, that you consider all of the individual sections of that transmission line. So you need to model all of the towers and, and their locations along the way between the, the two ends, because there is a complex distribution of currents. So let's, let's again look at this simple example in the software using this, uh, this schematic. Uh, it's the same story, we have three phases and we're simulating uh, faulted phase A connect uh, faulted at the local uh, substation earthing system node four. Now between node one and six or four and nine, we have multiple sections of transmission lines. So uh, sections between transmission towers. It's actually a five. In this case, it's a simple. It's a five kilometer line and the spans of 500 meters. The software does it automatically. Um, so you just specify the number of sections between the substations and it will insert but essentially um, transmission tower earthing systems uh, between the, the substations. Now, look. let's look at the, the total portion of the fault current. In this case, because the mutual coupling between the, the faulted phase on the transmission tower and the overhead earth wire, it's usually quite a few meters between those two conductors. So the coupling uh, and hence the return current by the earth wire is much less. Um, but still only 31% um, of the total fault current enters the uh, the local substation earth grid. Therefore, I only have to deal with 31% of the total earth fault current level when I'm designing my earthing system and when I'm thinking about designing for safe touch and step voltages. So 
the, the effect is not quite as good for overhand transmission lines. But what happens when we have these hybrid transmission lines and we need to analyze the, the fault currents? So um, we, we definitely need to use some software calculations. Uh, it's very much more efficient. I wouldn't want to do it by hand and I'll, I wouldn't recommend the simplifications with that. Um, it, it is complicated, um, but not, not really so with the software. With the software, you need some basic data. <clears throat> Let's talk about the basic data. So for the cable system, uh, on the left-hand side of this side, slide, you'll see you really need the cable positions. Now, if we're talking about single core cable, a single core cable system, you need to you need some cross section of the trench, like what is the phase separation uh, of the circuit between the phase conductors? What is the length of the circuit? If it's a, a multi core cable, you you will also need to specify the cable positions. Uh, the the phase positions will be much closer with a multi a three core cable. <clears throat> You'll need some basic cable data. You can get it from a cable manufacturer data sheet. You'll need the cable diameter, uh, conductor diameter, I should say. Now, these parameters are basically for the mutual uh, impedance calculations that we do in the software. You'll need the sheath diameter. You'll need the sheath thickness, sheath screen or armor. And uh, by the way, there are ways of combining uh, those effects uh, if you have multiple metallic layers. Um, Conductor and sheath resistance, AC resistance ideally. If you can't get AC resistance, you can use DC resistance and you can use a multiplier. Uh, we have some technical uh, articles on our website which explain how to uh, convert DC resistance into an AC equivalent. Um, and earthing point, uh, earth, bonding earth point resistance. Uh, so if you have uh, sheath or screen bonding points, intermediate bonding points, uh, those are usually designed to a uh, particular earthing resistance. Otherwise, you could simulate those and get an earthing resistance using software. Um, similarly, for overhead uh, lines, if you were dealing with it, uh, you want to analyze fault current, earth fault current analysis for an overhead line or a hybrid system, you'll need the phase and the earth wire positions. So you can usually obtain that from, uh, and I'll, I'll show an example, uh, a tower cross section, where you can see the, the locations of each phase conductor, their relative separations, and also the, the phase uh, location of the earth wires, if there's one or two. Um, that, that's also required and taken from, uh, taken from a, an overhead tower diagram. You'll need the length of the line and how many towers are between um, the sections or between the ends of the line. Uh, so how many subsections do you have? That will affect the fault current distribution. You'll need the overhead line conductor diameters and resistances. You can take those from a simple manufacturer catalog uh, you'll be able to, if you know the, you'll need to know the overhead conductor um, type, and then you can look up its diameter and resistance. And tower footing resistance. Um, if there's a design value or otherwise, um, if you can calculate it, you, you can use the software. If you know something about the, uh, the sewer resistivity and the design for that, you can also, you can also model that. Let's look at the first case study. So we're, we're talking about um, the two case studies are hybrid um, uh, transmission lines consisting of cables, complex cable systems, uh, and or uh, overhead transmission lines. So it's a 132 kV system. Uh, we've got a uh, cross-bonded uh, cable system and it's connected in series with a 10 kilometer overhead line consisting of 500 meter spans. And there is a single earth, uh, earth wire um, connected to the overhead line. 
Um, the earthing resistances at both ends. Remember, we, we talked about the local earthing system and the remote earthing system. Um, those are 0 0.2 ohms assumed. Uh, you can also calculate those. And then we've got an earthing joint, uh, joint bay uh, in, in the, uh, for the cross-bonded cable system. That is assumed to be 10 ohms. Um, and then we've got an underground and overhead transition station. Of course, when you're connecting uh, cables in series with overhead lines, you've got to have that transition. So at that transition point or transition station, um, there is an earthing system, and that is assumed to have an earthing resistance of 1.56 ohms. Uh, there, is a, there is a schematic here of the, the overhead. It's a cross-section of the overhead line. Uh, there, there would also be one for the cable system, but it's just shown as an example. And you, you need to know these distances and some of the impedances. This case study shows that high earth potential rise occurs at the underground and overhead transition stations. So where the, where the transmission line transfers from overhead to underground, those, that is a, a, a problem location. And um, an equivalent circuit model, circuit model was used to calculate EPR and, and the earth grid return currents. Basically, the software was used. So this is a schematic of the, of the system, again, using the software. Uh, and uh, you've got, in the middle here, you've got the cable system, uh, cross-bonded cable system. It's uh, 1.5 kilometers. It's not to scale, obviously. And then you've got a connected, you've got uh, a transition station, and that's connected between uh, the overhead line, connected to the overhead line. And on either end, you've got two substations. Now, remember, for this complex system, we, we really need to simulate uh, multiple earth fault scenarios. So the, the three lightning bolts there are the three... Um, earth fault scenarios that we've considered. We've considered a fault at su the substation on the left, an earth fault. And we also have considered an earth fault on the, the upstream uh, substation, an earth fault. And we've importantly, we've considered an earth fault at the transition station. Uh, we haven't considered an earth fault at the, uh, on, on the cable system. Um, but it's very important to um, calculate or to analyze the earth fault current distribution for different earth fault scenarios. And then we need to look at what's the worst scenario, which one results in the worst earth potential rise um, and the distribution of the currents. We've got some diagrams there of the typical, um, what these things typical look, typically look like. You've got cable ceiling ends in the substation on the left-hand side, and on the, the substation on the right-hand side, you've got gantries um, with an overhead transmission line termination. So after quite a bit of analysis, so you need to run the different fault scenarios, uh, the three different fault scenarios in the software, and I will I will briefly show you how to do that. Um, but but I have plotted. Um, uh, the resultant EPR at different locations here. That's what this plot is. So different points on the system, I have um, calculated and plotted the voltage, the EPR. And I've done that for different fault scenarios. So that's what the different colored plots are. And we can see that the EPR is very much different depending on uh, which location receives the fault, the earth fault. And um, also, uh, so the, the different fault scenarios result in higher voltages, but also um, the different locations also tend to have a higher voltage. And in this case, and what we've been alluding to is at the transition point where you go from underground to overhead is a very important location. Um, 
if you um, have a fault at the substation, uh, that will cut the highest EPR for this system will exist at the transition between underground and overhead. So that's where you need to be most careful about your, your surface touch and step voltages or your EPR. Let's look at a second case study. Now this is a, a complex cable transition uh, uh, transmission system, uh, 220 kV, um, consisting of, uh, on the left-hand side, a single point bonded cable system and with an ECC conductor. That's like an earth conductor um, connected between nodes four and 12. And then on the right-hand side, We've got a cross-bonded system, um, which is also transposed. You can see that the, the screens are transposed uh, to cancel the, the induced currents. Now, um, in this scenario, we've also uh, analyzed the earth fault current distribution. And it's a little bit complex because of all the mutual coupling and all the return paths that happen here. But just for example, and it's quite high, just for this example, we have, for example, a 25 kiloamp earth fault, prospective earth fault current level. Now, if I'm designing the earthing system, the local earthing system on the left-hand side, and I need to deal with 25 kiloamps um, be, being directed into my earthing system, it's going to be very difficult to achieve safe touch and step voltages. That's why we model the, the transmission system to see just how much of that prospective fault current would actually or realistically enter the earthing system. And in this case, uh, it's a little bit blurred, but you can see around two and a half thousand amps, a little bit more of the prospective 25,000. So a little bit over 10%, say, uh, of the total earth fault current level will enter my, my local earthing system and that's all I need to deal with. But you need to model these cable systems. You'll need to model their positions. You'll need to model the, the um, conductor types in, in a way you need conductor resistance. You'll need the screen resistances. You'll need the length, for example. Uh, another input is actually soil electrical resistivity. And it's, it's not as important, but you do need um, to know the earthing system impedance at both ends. Uh, like I said, it's not as important, especially the remote earthing system grid resistance. You can assume something. Uh, and, and of course, there's, there's a, a complex relationship and we can derive um, conclusions and uh, for, for this case study from uh, from the voltages that we plotted. Um, and we can see, uh, we looked at how screen resistance of the cables affects EPR. And um, the conclusion here is, um, as screen resistance increases, so from left to right on the plot, the current flowing into the earth grid uh, increases. Obviously, if you have a screen, a cable screen with a higher impedance, you're going to get worse earth fault currents entering your earthing systems. Less current will return via the cable screens because they have, have higher impedance. So this is obvious, right? Um, thus increasing the EPR at both ends. If you have higher current currents entering the earthing systems, you're going to have higher EPR at, at your earthing systems. And it's going to be harder to design them. Uh, in the case of the joint, the EPR does not very much. Very much. We had a joint uh, between the two cable systems in the middle. Varying screen resistance didn't really uh, change that much. We also looked at ECC uh, optimal position. You can optimally position the ECC, which I'll talk about briefly. Uh, and that if just by optimally positioning the ECC, you can reduce EPRs. We looked at uh, the maximum cable screen voltage for varying screen resistance. I think we, short, we showed here that actually 
when you have different screen resistances, which is effectively different ca uh, cables uh, or cable sizes. Um, it doesn't vary. Uh, maximum screen voltages don't vary much, but the voltages on the earthing systems do. Um, we looked at um, varying the ECC size. So that's like an earthing conductor for the single point bonded system generally. Um, and varying the size of that. Um, if I suppose if you do have a, a problem with EPR, you could perhaps utilize uh, ECC size to reduce EPR. Um, and there is some uh, sort of noticeable effect if we increase the size of the ECC earthing conductor. ECC size does have an effect, as I, as I mentioned, between, in this case, it was between 30 and 35% uh, reductions in, in EPR of the system by changing or by increasing the size of the ECC. Obviously it's, it's an additional cost, but Compared to mitigating higher EPRs, it may be a small cost. Um, but it, where a, a big win can happen quite easily is to op optimally position the ECC conductor itself to position that well uh, optimally with respect to the phase conductor positions. Um, and we can see quite a significant um, increase uh, in, in EPR um, or percentage difference just by positioning the ECC well. This slide shows um, uh, some recommended ECC positioning um, that the ECC should be uh, really as close to the uh, base conductors of your cable system as possible, and it should be transposed uh, in the middle of the of the cable system uh, to reduce circulating currents and losses. Uh, so the tra cable transition joint resistance, uh, we saw if if that were to vary in resistance, what would be the effect on EPR? We saw that um, varying that resistance obviously would have a significant Im impact on the EPR at the cable joint. Um, but it, it, it looks like, in this case, it doesn't have much of an effect, um, even varying very significantly from 0 0.1 ohms up to 10 ohms. You don't get much variance in the EPR um, at the, the substation earthing systems. So therefore, what we're saying is, Perhaps you don't have to worry too much in terms of earthing safety. Um, perhaps you don't have to worry too much about the actual earthing resistance at the cable joint locations or bonding locations. So in conclusion and, and some recommendations, EPR, EPR of the earthing grids is generally not a concern when substations are connected by a cable transmission line. We saw that uh, in, in that simple case that we modeled, 96% uh, of the total earth fault current will return by the cable screens and not cause you an issue uh, at the uh, local earthing system. Um, that's what makes it really powerful and easy uh, to do the designs. This is because the majority of the fault current returns on the cable screens. Point number two, the EPR may be relatively high if substations are connected by an overhead transmission line. You can still, by modeling this, um, and if you do have a transmission line, which, is, which has an overhead earth wire, must have an overhead earth wire, and those are bonded at both ends, um, still, again, we saw that only around 30, 34% of the, the prospective earth fault current enters the earthing system. So 66% of the prospective earth fault will return to the source and not cause you an issue. So still it, it is substantial, but it's not as substantial for cable systems. Cable systems really do have a high 
portion of the ret uh, return current. Um, point number three, excessive EPR is likely to occur at the underground and overhead line transitions of a hybrid transition line or a siphon system. So if you are dealing and designing a hybrid cable uh, transition transmission line with an overhead line section, at these transition points, you will most likely experience the highest EPR at these transition joints. So you need to model different fault scenarios. You need to model the faults at the transition joints, but actually we saw a fault at the substation causes the highest EPR at the transition station. Point number four, um, for earth faults, the influence of the earthing impedance at the, the UGO transition points on EPR is significant. Uh -huh. And point number five, we saw, we examined ECC position should be optimal and transposed and ECC size does significantly affect EPR and screen to earth voltages or, or EPR. Um, so that concludes uh, the technical presentation. I will very briefly, before we come to your questions, I believe we've been collecting your questions through, throughout the presentation. Uh, Edston will, will kindly uh, uh, hand them over to me in a minute. Um, but this is the software, this is Safe Grid Earthing software. Uh, this is the fault current distribution module. Uh, you can select uh, different cable systems. In this case, um, we've got one transition transmission line uh, consisting of actually, this is a siphon system. We've got on the left hand side, the first section is a transmission overhead transmission line. In the middle, we've got a cross bonded cable section. And on the right hand side, again, we've got uh, an overhead transmission line. We can simulate different fault types. Um, actually, so it's most common with earthing system to des design to simulate a single phase to, to ground or a single phase to earth fault. So I can change the faulted phase if I want and recalculate the fault currents. Actually, the software will, you know, if I don't know which which um, phase to fault, which one would give the, the worst case, the software can actually tell me that. It will actually tell me that it's actually a worst case if I fault um, phase A. Um, so that, that's what I'll do. Now, so for each of the sections, for the overhead line and the cable section, so the first overhead line section, I need to specify the length, the overall length, uh, soil electrical resistivity, and the positions. Uh, this is uh, this overhead line only has a single uh, earth wire, so I need to model the um, relative positions of the phase conductors and the earth wire. And then on the right hand side, some I need some data to enter some data about the the phase conductors and the earth conductors or the earth conductor in this point in, in this case, number of sub subsections. I can have multiple towers between the ends of the overhead transmission line. In this case, it's only modeling one. Um, the cable system, which is a cross bonded cable system, we, we can model solidly bonded, single point bonded, all different types of cable system. And again, it's the relative position. Um, there's also the, the ECC position. <clears throat> and then the conductor um, parameters. And um, I, can, I can simply calculate all of the currents and, and the voltages in this network. Now for my earthing system design, because this software is about designing an earthing system and it's about um, the, the earth fault current level. So this is in this case, maximum. Uh, prospective earth fault current level is 10,000 amps. But if I go back and I use the fault current module results, uh, this um, smaller value um, and recalculate the results. Um, I should end up with, with much lower um, voltages for my earthing system. 
So that's the gist of it. That's the that's the the point of the bulk current calculations with respect to uh, earthing systems and complex cable and overhead uh, transmission lines. So we'll go ahead and I'll and I'll I'll try to answer some of your technical or other questions. Thanks, Edston. Thanks, thanks, Jason. So. Let me read out a few questions that were asked. Uh, the first question is, uh, does the proximity of the local and remote earth grids affect current distribution? The proximity, um, it does. So I assume you mean like the distance between substation A and substation B perhaps? I mean, um, of course, uh, proximity affects um, even even conductance through the soil is affected, but you can imagine that you know the length of the line is reduced, so uh, it it does have a significant effect um, on the proximity of the ends of the substation. Yes. Okay. Uh, the next question is uh, because the grid becomes readily interconnected, uh, how do we define uh, the source of injection? Uh, so that we can define a local and a remote earthing grid. Sorry, can you repeat that? Uh, so they're talking about a radial interconnected system. Yeah. So they want to know how do they select the point of uh, of well, which is the source of injection point, and then how do they select the remote substation? Okay, so in this case, because we're we're designing the low, the objective of this this study is to design the local earthing system. So we're assuming um, uh, some fault. Uh, the local substation is involved in an earth fault. Uh, so uh, that is, yeah, radially connected, but it also could be connected. Remember, there could be parallel transmission lines uh, feeding the fault as well, and, and you can model that uh, in the software as well, um, just by adding um, parallel transmission lines, so I can I can add a line in parallel. Um, so these systems can get even more complex, um, but effectively we assume that uh, at the remote end the the current is being uh, uh, provided or source. That's the source of the fault currents, and on the left hand side. Uh, you've got your local system under study. So the next question is, um, can we model an insulated ECC uh, with a with a cable system? Actually, if I'm not mistaken, the ECC is assumed to be insulated, right? Um, so yes, um, uh, generally in practice, the ECC is insulated. And then that, that's what it's assumed to be in the software. Otherwise, you would need to use a different model uh, in SafeGrid to, to do that. Uh, uh, is it different if we use HVDC transmission systems uh, to do the same calculations, or can we use it? Uh, it is different. Um, we can you, you can you can still model it. We we're talking about um, really passive earthing system uh, impedances. Uh, you you could use some um, DC resistances, uh, but however, you would need to also use uh, like uh, a zero hertz, and the mutual impedances would need to be neglected. Uh, so it it would be a simpler. I think it would be simpler conditions, actually. Um, I, I don't believe it's something we, that we've tried, but perhaps we could. Yeah, thanks for the question. How do we model pipelines? Yeah, I think that will be subject the subject of a, another presentation. We do have... Um, a module, um, it's actually, it's not released yet, but it's it's about to be released. 
um, on that on that very topic. They are interconnected. You're exactly. I can see you. Uh, uh, can, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, it's one, one. One. It, 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 it would. Okay, I was, I was disconnected for a second there. Um, so it was about metallic pipelines, right? Yeah. Yeah, that that will be a subject um of a another um, presentation, but yeah, they're very interconnected. Um, when you do these fault current uh, distribution studies, obviously the, the currents that are on the transmission lines um, are induced into the uh, metallic pipelines, but we there's another. Also significant factors. So that's the mutual coupling uh, or the magnetic induction. But there's also um, there's also conductive coupling. I hope everyone can hear me. There's there's also conductive coupling through the soil um, when there's an earth fault. Um, we will do another presentation. Thanks for the question. Okay. I think we will have one, one more question. One more question. Yeah. Um, so so how are how are armors considered in uh, in single core cables? Um, um it, assuming of course obviously that there'll be earth the armors will be earth that um at both ends. So they they're they want to work at a single point. Armor. Um, uh, I'm not sure if that's that's actually really practical, but if it's if it's at a single point, um, you know, the, the, it won't be a return path. Um, but I assume there would be an ECC. Um, but uh, in the case of single point bonded cables, um, there would be an ECC, and that that would be the the return path. Um, please um, feel free to. Um, send me an email um you can um send it to support at elect.com support at elek.com and just just i'll uh, mention my name if you have any further questions thank you everyone thank you edston um thanks everyone for attending um i hope you you've all got something out of it um and we look forward to running more technical presentations soon. Thank you and bye bye. Thanks, Jason. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.